Josiah's six steps to spiritual success. Uh, before we get into that, I uh, want to maybe refresh your memory as to where Josiah fits into uh, the history of, of Israel and Judah. We're going to go back over two and a half thousand years uh, in history uh, to about 640 BC. Uh, it's about 350 years um, before King David. Uh, around that time, obviously, David's the most famous king of Israel. And uh, sadly, not long after David, uh, the kingdom of Israel split up into two, into Israel, the ten tribes, and, and Judah, the two tribes of uh, Benjamin and Judah. And uh, quite a lot of bad kings, sadly, after David. And uh, we get to um, one of Josiah's ancestors, Hezekiah, who turned things around in a, in a marvelous way through God's help. Um, but unfortunately, all the good stuff that Hezekiah did was undone by Josiah's grandfather, Manasseh, who reigned for 55 years. It's the longest reign of any of the kings of this period. And uh, he was probably the worst of the lot. And uh, took it, took uh, Judah into idol worship and uh, all kinds of awful things and neglected to worship God, uh, perhaps more than any other king. Then uh, Josiah's father uh, came along uh, thankfully, he only lasted eight years, but that was 63 years um, of real suffering for the people. And then Josiah comes along and uh, he comes along as king as a very, very young boy. And uh, turns out that he's the best king uh, that came along since King David. And God recognized that, as we'll see later. And so perhaps there's some lessons that we can learn in, uh, in our own spiritual lives and uh, to be successful uh, as God defines it, of course, 
in our Christian lives. So let's let's start to look at Josiah and A. We're going to look at Second Chronicles 34. And uh, it says that Josiah was eight years old when he became king. And he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and followed the ways of his father David, not turning aside to the right or the left. In the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, he began to seek the God of his father David. So, of course, the first thing to notice is just how young Josiah was. Just eight years old. He was slightly older than Joash, one of his ancestors, uh, who I think was seven years old. Um, Josiah was just eight. Uh, what a situation for a young lad to be brought into. Uh, a kingdom in chaos, a kingdom that had gone away from God, and uh, people looking to this young lad to turn things around, perhaps. And uh, what it said about him in this opening verse is very significant. It says, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and followed the ways of his father David. You'll find that David was always the benchmark uh, that the kings were judged against uh, because he was a man after God's own heart. And it looks like Josiah had the heart of David too. And it says he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, and that just made me uh, realize that God is always watching. And uh, does that make us feel uh, reassured or confident or happy? Or does it make us feel embarrassed or fearful or shamed? Um, that's a really challenging question, isn't it? Um, but certainly God could see uh, everything that Josiah did. And uh, for the most part, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And uh, just one mistake really at the end of his life that meant he, he only lived to the age of 39, which was quite sad. But during those 31 years, he, he did a really good job. Now I want to highlight uh, now the, the verse, that, the, the word that I've highlighted there, that he began to seek the God of his father, David. And I think that's a very, very important word and a very good place to start when we're looking to uh, be pleasing to God and looking to live our, our life for God. To, to First of all, to seek him. So let's look at that. The word seek uh, in the Old Testament, at least the one I looked at in, in this verse, um, carries the thought of, of treading a path uh, to wear a path in the ground by, by constant use. And I thought that was a lovely picture for us to understand what it means to, to, uh, to wait to seek the Lord. And it's not something that's um, necessarily a, a quick process. It's a constant process. It might be a repetitive process um, to, to come and, uh, and, and look for God and to seek him with all our hearts. And we can think of that uh, country path that uh, is worn because people go up and down it day after day after day. That's the thought here that, uh, that Josiah did, which is a good example to us. Reminding me of another verse in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, where God makes a, a special promise to his people. And he says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. And uh, so this matter of seeking is about uh, the direction um, of ourselves, of our lives, pointing it towards God. And it might require some repentance because repentance means turning away uh, from uh, ourselves and our way of working and turning to God. So uh, that's step one, I think, in Josiah's uh, experience that he first of all sought the Lord and we should do that too. The, uh, the second uh, step that I think Josiah took was uh, maybe one that wouldn't occur to us necessarily immediately. It's that he waited. He waited on the Lord. And uh, the reason we know that is because it says in his 12th year, he began. Well, we'll find out what he began to do in a minute. But the point is, there was a period of four years from when he was 16, uh, eight years after he came to the throne, that he started to seek the Lord. But it was only four years later that he actually began to do something. And uh, that's a good lesson for us uh, when we like to rush and get things done. And... Uh, that wasn't the case for Josiah. He waited, and it was only in his 12th year that it, he began. Reminding me of uh, a verse in Psalm 25. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. There's the idea of the, the well-worn path again. Leave me in your truth and teach me, 
for you are the God of my salvation. On you, I wait all the day. And this was David's experience. Perhaps he learned that as a shepherd boy. Uh, lots of time on his hands and he waited uh, for God uh, to, to, to see the God's direction and leading in his life. And you can just think of Josiah and he's like, there's so much that needs to be done. There's, there's 63 years of decline to be reversed. I've just got to get going, got to get things started. And it seems to me that he resisted the temptation and, uh, and instead waited on the Lord. And uh, so that when he, when he started what he had to do, uh, he really hit the ground running, as we'll see, and did some amazing things for God. So um, maybe that's a lesson for us. Um, sometimes going full speed ahead and running ahead of the Lord uh, isn't always the best outcome. The other thing to mention is uh, going back to the root word of waiting. There's a connection there with the the weaving um, process, uh, and in, I'm thinking the Arabic uh, language. It's connected to the thought of a spider's web, and uh, I think that's quite apt, isn't it? We think of the spider just weaving and weaving and weaving and weaving gradually that web, and then just waiting, patiently waiting until the purpose of that web comes to fruition and the, uh, the fly is caught. And it might take a long time, but they just wait and wait and wait. And that's what Josiah did, it seems. He waited for God, waited for the right time to strike and to act on God's behalf. The third uh, step I'd like to share with you is about purging. And uh, we'll explain what purging means in a second. But uh, in verses three and four, it says, in his 12th year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem, high places, Asherah poles and idols. Under his direction, the altars of the Baals were torn down and he cut to pieces the incense altars that were above them and smashed the Asherah poles and the idols. And these he broke to pieces and scattered over the graves of those who were sacrificed to them. Well, talk a little bit more about what he did but so uh, you'll see that picture there of this man trying to polish his car I don't know if you're a car polisher or not um, I'm certainly not but some people love to have their car uh, spick and span and polished so that you can see your face in it and uh, make the car as bright as possible and that's this thought behind the word purge uh, the root word is bright and so you can see how Israel's faithfulness uh, had dulled. It was a very dull faithfulness, if there was any faithfulness at all. And uh, part of this purging process, this cleansing process, was to polish um, and to rub, to get rid of the dirt and the dust and the grime so that what was left behind was gleaming and, uh, and bright for God. And that's something as a Christian that we're commanded to do, to, to put away, to purge, to cleanse ourselves from all the things that will get in the way of serving God. But just look at these um, action words that we see in, uh, in this, these verses. He tore down the altars of the false God. He cut to pieces the altars that were sacrificed, uh, used for sacrifices. He smashed the Asherah poles, the, uh, the false gods, um, instruments of worship. And then he broke them to pieces and scattered them over the graves of those who had sacrificed to them. Love to explore some of that um, in more detail, but uh, we don't have time this morning, but uh, we have more to explore here. Um, more action words here. He burned the bones of the priests on their altars. That's the, the false uh, priests of the idols, of course. And he purged Judah and Jerusalem. And it's interesting here, he says, in the towns of Manasseh, Ephraim and Simeon, as far as Naphtali, and in the ruins around them, he tore down the altars crushed the idols to powder and cut to pieces the incense altars. What's significant about that geography is that's the northern part of Israel. That's actually outside his territory. Um, so the influence of, um, of Josiah uh, wasn't just on his, his, his own uh, area of responsibility. It, it, it spilled over into the lives of others. And, and I think that's something very powerful, isn't it? That our holy living uh, and our testimony and our witness, our actions 
uh, almost inevitably, for good or bad, have an influence beyond their borders. And uh, in this case, it was a good influence. And uh, he was able to clean up and help other people to get back to God. And that's another reason why um, Josiah was such a good king. Just imagine the amount of work that went in to crushing these idols to powder. And uh, you, might have, you might think that uh, someone would say to Josiah, Josiah, is that really necessary? Do, do you really know, need to go to that level of detail and that uh, finality? And uh, just a really good lesson to us that uh, when holiness is involved, um, it brings a passion, it brings a zeal uh, for God's things and a desire to, to completely put away sin so that it can't come back. And um, crushing idols to powder was such a powerful uh, illustration of what was in Josiah's heart. Then uh, number four is that Josiah started to build. And uh, in fact, really, it's more of a repair job. He says that uh, in the 18th year of his reign, so when he was 26, uh, he ordered the temple to be repaired. And it says that they gave money to the carpenters and builders to purchase dressed stone um, because the, uh, the kings of Judah had allowed the temple to fall into ruin. We'll, let, we'll come on to look at why it's important, this financial aspect. Um, but for now, I just wanted to focus on the fact that uh, we need to recognize that our lives and our churches need repair. And that could be either through disuse or misuse or constant use. Um, we, we need to recharge the batteries. We need to recognize that people grow older and functions in our churches uh, have to change and people have to step up. Um, there's new things that need to, to happen uh, in accordance with God's will. And uh, this is what Josiah recognized, that disuse had caused disrepair. And uh, he'd made it a priority to put God's house first and uh, make sure that was in tip-top shape, for the worship of God, because that was something that was very important, of course, for the king of Judah. Moving on quickly to number five of about six steps to success. And uh, of course I have a Bible here, but uh, wasn't uh, available to the people at that time. It was the book of the law that uh, was uh, their instruction manually in effect for living for God. And that had been lost unbelievably. The book of the law, God's Old Testament law um, that we find in Exodus and Leviticus numbers had been lost. It had become of such little value and it had been shoved somewhere in, in a back cupboard in the temple. And in fact, they thought that the, that the book had been lost and it was found. And um, the impact on Jos Josiah's life was absolutely massive. And credit to, to Josiah, all the things that he did up to now, he had done without reading God's word. And when he found it, he, I think he recognized that what he was doing was right but he also recognized how far wrong that they had gone. And so very interesting, very important what, what he did next. He says, uh, in 2 Chronicles 34, that the king called together all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which had been found in the temple of the Lord. And then it says, the king stood by his pillar and renewed the, his covenant in the presence of the Lord to follow the Lord, keep his commands with all his heart and soul to obey the words of the covenant written in the book. And uh, <clears throat> this idea of, of a pillar is um, quite significant. It speaks of uh, strength. It speaks of stability, of faithfulness. And um, whenever we see the king and the pillar um, together in the Old Testament, then it's, it's usually a good sign. And um, just wonder whether the word of God has the impact on our lives that, um, that it had on Josiah and the people. And we can get very complacent, can't we, about God's word. Maybe it's stuck in a cupboard somewhere. And uh, <clears throat> it's been lost effectively as far as we're concerned. And when we read it, it, it really doesn't hit our hearts. It really doesn't have an impact on us. And that, that would be sad if that's the case. So let's be like Josiah and be gripped by God's word, be moved by God's word, moved in our hearts, and then move to action to obey what we find in it. 
And then finally, <clears throat> an active, uh, another active word is walk. And um, I want to take you back to Jeremiah chapter 22 and uh, words that, that, that God spoke uh, in, to Josiah's son, uh, Shalom, who uh, unfortunately didn't follow his father. And uh, it says, this is what the Lord says about it. Shalom, son of Josiah, who succeeded his father as king of Judah, but has gone from this place. He will never return. He will die in the place where they have led him captive. He will not see this land again. Very, very sad that um, God's judgment on, on Shalom was to be taken into captivity. And uh, that was something that was uh, going to be a lifelong thing. And God's saying, you're done. Um, no more chances. And uh, a lot of the work of Josiah was sadly um, not going to be long lasting. Jeremiah goes on to say, Woe to him who builds his palace by unrighteousness, his upper rooms by injustice, making his own people work for nothing, not paying them for their labor. And he says, I will build myself a great palace with spacious upper rooms and makes large windows in it, panels it with cedar and decorates it with red. These are all signs of, of affluence and wealth and, and the latest fashion. Does it make you a king to have more and more cedar? Didn't your father have food and drink? And of course, he's pointing out that um, God prospered Josiah without all um, the excess that his son followed. Then we find um, God's uh, seal of approval, really, if you like, on the reign of Josiah in contrast. And he says he did what was right and just. So all went well with him. He defended the cause of the poor and needy and all went well. Is that not what it means to know me, declares the Lord. And of course, um, when we talk about success and Josiah's success, really wasn't um, in connection with military success or uh, military victories um, or acquiring great wealth. It was the fact that he pleased God. And uh, that was really the object of his life. It reminds me really of, of the picture of a, of a three-legged stool um, and what I'm thinking about here is three things that um, God is looking for. He looked for that three things in the life of the kings, and he looks for three things in our lives too. And um, one of them is, is holiness. And uh, that might involve keeping the world out, saying um, these are our borders and um, the world is not going to come in. And so the standards of holiness that we that we build and we, we hold the line. And um, that was something that Josiah did. And he got rid of all the false idols that had infiltrated the land of, of Judah. And, uh, and we need to do the same as well, because the world wants to do great damage to uh, our lives, basically, and, and our testimony. The second one is, is worship. And we saw how uh, Josiah prioritized um, the worship of God and enabling it to function with um, architecture and, and uh, making sure it was all in good condition. And uh, we can't afford to neglect the worship of God, can we, in our lives? We need to make that a real focus, and uh, like Josiah did. And then finally, um, this thought of justice, uh, that, that uh, of all the things that Josiah did, it's interesting that this was the thing that God commended him for in Jeremiah that he was a just king and that he dealt well with the oppressed and the needy and, and the poor. And um, this is the one that I think we maybe don't give quite enough attention to and um, not something that's often spoken about. It's the need for us as disciples of the Lord Jesus to be, to be just and to be seen to be just in what we do and um, both collectively and individually. And so uh, let's, let's perhaps give that a bit more thought as to what that looks like, uh, holding God's justice, his love for, for those that are uh, getting, a, getting a raw deal in society. And uh, of course, part of that is preaching the gospel to them because that's a, something wonderful that's open to all. So there we have it, six steps, seek, wait, purge, build, read, and walk. Um, I'd suggest that uh, read only came so far down the list for Josiah because 
he only found the Buckle of War after quite a few years of his reign. <laughs> but um, for us, of course, the reading um, might come far higher up the chain as we seek uh, and as we wait on the Lord. But you can think about that this week, of course. I wanted to close with uh, a hymn that uh, I think would have been very much applicable to, to young Josiah at the start of his life as he sought the Lord and waited on him and committed to, to live his life for him. It's, uh, it's a hymn written many, many years ago um, by a woman called Marianne Farningham. And she was born uh, a couple hundred years ago now. And um, if you're like me, not as young as we once were, but uh, recognizing that every day is a new day, we can start from where we are and make these kinds of vows to the Lord. And uh, she writes, just as I am thine own to be, friend of the young who lovest me, to consecrate myself to thee, Lord Jesus Christ, I come. In the glad morning of my day, my life to give, my vows to pay, with no reserve and no delay, with all my heart, I come. I would live ever in the light. I would work ever for the right. I would serve thee with all my might. Therefore, to thee I come. And the last verse says, Just as I am, young, strong and free, to be the best that I can be for truth and righteousness in thee, Lord of my life, I come. Just as I am, I am.